Hi, I'm Bob Alsop with Shop Saber CNC. Around here they call me Router Bob. We have an exciting video for you. We're going to be making a knockdown control stand on a Shop Saber Pro 510 CNC router. The Shop Saber Pro Series CNC router is one of the most popular CNC routers in the world. Before we start on our project, let's look at why they're so popular. Well, it actually starts with the frame structures. We build the frames out of structural steel. The base is all welded one piece. We also have structural steel gantries and structural steel supports. The rigidity and the design of that frame is why we have such great edge finishes and why we have such accurate machines, and that's why these are so popular. Now, let's look at motion control. The first part of machine motion is actually defining the axis of motion, and let's look at that. What you see here are precision contour guide rails, and that's actually what causes these axes to move. But there's more to it than that. They're actually mounted to a, a machine gantry, and so the surfaces they mount to are machine, and that's what actually contributes so much to the accuracy. Since we're an American manufacturer, we have total control of all that. Now, let's see what actually makes it move. What creates the motion on the machines are actually precision ball screws, and we use them in the X, Y, and Z axis. What generates that motion are Mitsubishi closed loop servos. Now let's stop for a minute. Let's talk about ball screw drives and rack and pinions because we hear that all the time, and we make both, so we know a whole lot about the engineering involved. First off, with a typical rack and pinion, there's always going to be some play that's inherent to it. There has to be backlash, a three to five thousandths, so that they don't hang up. Well, here's what happens when you're actually machine. If you're doing really precision stuff, somewhere on that table that shows up, you'll see a mark on an edge. We don't have that problem with ball screws because ball screws are preloaded, so there's no play in them. Now, another thing that we hear sometimes is, oh, well, we use planetary drives to take care of that rack and pinion problem. Well, that actually adds to it <laughs> because it does not replace the rack and pinion. It replaces a belt drive. Planetary drives also have place, so you're actually adding more to it. So people who tell you that that t solves that problem don't really know what they're talking about. Now, let's look at the last part of machine motion, and that's the motion control itself. We developed a Shop Saber MMP machine control based on a real robust machine control technology. In fact, MMP stands for Mitsubishi Motion Platform. But there's another part of machine control that's people related. It has to do with your operator. You know, how easy it is for the operator to run the machine every day, how easy is it to learn how to use it, uh, what kind of qualifications does a machine operator had to be. And we really wanted to create an environment where a typical worker could be successful with a machine. Let me show you how easy it is to run this machine. One of the things I really like about the Shop Saber MMP controller is how easy the interface is to use. Everything's on one screen. Now let's take a look at that. The buttons in this area right here also have keyboard buttons that correspond to those, and that's how you move the machine around on all the different axes. And you can move it incrementally or, or at slow, medium, and fast speeds. These are buttons down here that have to do with more daily things you do, like combing the machine, touching tools, offsetting zeros, those kinds of things. This area over here actually shows the coordinates and these slides, both the slide here and the slide here, allow you to change feed rates and spindle RPMs while the machine's running. The actual G-code while the machine's running is displayed here, and this is a graphic interface. Now let me show you how simple it is for the operator. You simply go File, Open. I open the program that I want to run. In this case, this is our desk. I hit the icon up here to view it, and this shows me on the screen what's actually going to be cut. And I can immediately look at that and see visual validation if the parts look like what I was hoping they look like. And then to run the program, I just hit cycle start or green, and it starts executing. And as it's executing, you actually see uh, the movement on the control. Now let's take a look at the machine spindle. This machine has an HSD 10.7 horsepower ATC spindle. ATC stands for automatic tool change. We also have different horsepower spindles depending on what your machining needs are. Now, let's step back and look at some of the engineering on here. For one thing, if the part fits under the gantry, we have the ability to machine it. We do that by increasing the actual uh, Z travel. Now, there's an interesting development right here, and we call these stiffeners, and let me tell you the story behind that. We challenge engineering to come up with a design that would make the spindle stiffer 
when it's extended and contacting the material. So they went into our engineering software, it's finite element analysis is what it's called, and we tried several different scenarios and we found one that tested out on the software really, really good. Then we did the machine test and it, and it really proved out. Then we went back and we said, okay, now how can we achieve this same effect and reduce mass? And that's why you see these cutouts in here. That all came out of our engineering software. Now, what that does is that gives you the ability to do more 3D machining. And when you get into 3D machining, you immediately start thinking about speed. What most people don't understand is that 3D machining is determined by the slowest axis. So even though your machine may move around fast, if the z-axis is slow, that limits what you can do. So we started focusing on that. Here's how we did it. We put a balancing cylinder up here. Now what that does is it takes the mass of the spindle off of the ball nut. That lets us accelerate and decelerate that whole assembly much faster. That gives you really, really fast 3D machining. We call this concept Super Z technology. Now let's look at the machine table. This machine has an optional phenolic table. We also make tables in aluminum and other materials. Now, if you notice, this also has the T-slot feature. Well, what that allows you to do is to clamp special fixtures on there for machining. So just in that alone, we know that this machine has been designed for a lot of different capabilities. Now, the vacuum table itself is actually operated with these ports. And there's actually eight of them, and those ports feed into a vacuum plenum that's actually an integral part of the frame. And then that's fed back to the vacuum pump itself. All that's done with hard tubing so we don't have losses that you have with flex hose. Now, you'll notice the table is actually large, and it, it says it's five feet wide, but you'll find out on our machines that the tables are larger. That's 72 inches. The reason we do that is that gives you expandability in the future. So let's say you buy this and you decide that you want to uh, put a knife head on there or a camera or something like that. There's enough travel for that. Something else that's neat about this table also is since we machine all this with the router head, it's really, really flat and you don't have to have gasket or glue or whatever to hold your spool board down. So it makes flow through machining very, very good. A really popular feature that we have on these also are pop-up pins. This machine doesn't have them, but that's a very popular feature. Now, let's go into the office and let's look at the software. I wanted to create a neat product with panel processing and I wanted to use three quarter inch Baltic birch and so I created a, what I call a knockdown which means you can take it apart and put it back together control stand. So sometimes around your machine maybe you need a stand to put a monitor or a keyboard or something on it. That's what this is. And the way I undertook it first was to start with a concept in solid modeling. Now let's take a look at this. What you see on the screen here is actually the product. And you see, this is, this is Rhino that I'm using. I could do the same thing in SketchUp or I could do the same thing in Fusion 360. And this is what the product looks like. To give you an idea of size, it's about uh, desk height, so it's about 30 inches tall. And let's look at this a little bit in uh, Ghosted and you can see how the parts fit together. You see, you have these cross braces that lock in here. There's one at the top and the bottom. And now down here, th this actual shelf, uh, I use Rayfix Faster to support that. And it's a really, really nice product. What's neat about it is there's very little hardware. Now you'll see holes here and here to screw this assembly together. These pieces fit up into the top. So it came out really, really nice. So I'm, I'm really pleased with, with how this came out. Now the next step is let's figure out how do we get from a solid model that we've developed into something that I can actually uh, toolpath on VCAR Pro. Let's take a look at that next step. To make one of these solid parts, we really just need some basic geometry. So let me show you how you get to that point. First off, let's, let's look at our object here. And let's take, this end panel has some, probably the most operations on it. The first thing I'm gonna do is make a copy of it. Would you get that over here? And then I think I'll just take the rest of this and hide it so we don't have to look at it. Now you see our copy is kind of sitting up on edge, so let's look at the front view and let's rotate this, so let's lay it down. Let's make sure we know which way. We've actually got holes on this side, so we want those to be up. So we need to rotate it clockwise, so we'll go transform, rotate. We'll select it, we'll accept it, and we'll just pick a pivot point and rotate it 90 degrees. Okay, so you see that. And then probably from the top view, we'll rotate it again, so we'll transform rotate and that actually looks pretty good 
Okay. Now, what I need to do now is actually get the geometry, and I'll show you how you do that. I'm going to come up here where it says curve, curve from objects, duplicate face border. When I do that, you notice that what it did was it picked up the outline and also these holes. I'm going to join those together. All right. So now I've got that piece of geometry. Actually, we can actually just hide the part to tell you the truth. We can hide that. And there's our parts. Let's join that together. And now, so that's the geometry that I need to send over to VCAR Pro because that's all I have to have for tool pathing. All right now, let me show you the step that we use to do that. We select that. So we select the part, and I'll say File, Export. And we'll make that, we're going to export that as a DXF. And we're going to call that Right End, and we'll save it. Now we'll go into VCAR Pro and I'll show you how that opens. Okay, now I've opened up a VCAR file and all I have to do is go to this folder for Import Vectors. Remember Vectors Align. There's the DXF I just created. All right, and that's what it looks like. Okay. Now, if you notice, it's not joined together necessarily. So the first thing I'm going to do is circle all of this, hit the Join button. It's going to tell me when I'm finished, there's going to be four closed geometries. Okay, there's one of them. There's one, and then there's one, and there's one. There's two holes, all right? So now the next thing, before I do anything else, I'm going to select all of them, and I'm going to hit this little chain button. Here's what that does. That becomes one block or one unit. So when I move it, everything moves together, all right? So that's the first step. So then I take each one of those parts in my 3D model, position it correctly, strip the geometry off, and then I bring it into VCAR Pro. Then I nest it. Let me show you what one of those nests looks like. So there's what our nest looks like. And you can see how all the parts fit in. We can count all the parts that are on there. Now, let's look at tool pathing and how we're actually going to cut this out. Right, we'll go over here to the tool path. Let's look at the simulation. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to drill some five millimeter holes. All right, so let's look at that. Now, it, they're hard to see here, but those holes are for ray fixes. They're for the studs for ray fixes. And then we have some through holes that are five millimeters. We'll get those drilled. There's those. And then we've got some inside cuts. And when I say inside, that's those pockets. So an inside cut, I'm, I'm basically saying I'm going to cut some of those pockets out. All right, we'll preview that. Okay, and then we have some 20 millimeter holes. And those holes are for ray fixes. And so we'll cut those. Simulate that. And then we have some pockets. And these pockets actually are, they're in the underside of the top, and they're used for the side panels to fit up into, so that's those pockets. We'll simulate those. And then finally, we're going to start cutting parts out. And I want to talk to you a little bit about a concept here of how we handle small parts. When you're using flow through and nesting, uh, sometimes you have problems with smaller parts moving around, so the way we deal with that is we do it just like the cabinet softwares do. We identify what a small part is, and the first thing we do is we go around the perimeter of each of those parts and we leave an onion skin of about 30 thousandths. That keeps everything in place. Then we return back to those parts and we cut all the way through, then we cut the big parts. Now let's see how that looks like on simulation. Okay, so here's the onion skin. There's those parts. Then we're going to return back and cut through them. And then we cut through the large parts. And that's what we have left. So that's basically how the tool pathing is done on this. Then my next step is to create the G-code and send it out to the machine control. Now, let's go out to the machine control and let's cut this cabinet out.
Our knockdown control stand project came out really, really nice. The edge finishes are great. It's unbelievable how rigid it is, and it's just minimal hardware required. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, you can contact us at shopsaber.com. Thank you for watching.